Namaste and in La Ketch, and welcome to another episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and as always, we need to remember what those two phrases, where they come from and what they mean. Namaste comes from the Sanskrit spoken, it's called Brahmi, and it simply means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In La Ketch, on the other hand, comes from the Mayan, and it means I am another you. So imagine that if when you're greeting someone and just thinking about it on you know, your daily passage through life, right? The difference that that kind of awareness would make. Great. Okay, so this episode's guest is Costa. Um, Oh gosh, I almost said Macreas, but it's Macreas, right? Macreas. Yeah. Macreas. Um, <laughs> he sometimes goes by Gus, but uh, Costa has been uh, an acquaintance of mine for quite some time, and, and we've had a couple of chats together. By day, he is a quality assurance engineer and, and analyst. He's a computer programmer. Um, he's a and his passion, though, is. The, he's the founder of ET Let's Talk. And what that is about, we'll get into in just a little bit, but it kind of gives you the, just the idea by the name. Uh, he also is the uh, founder of, uh, one of the co-founders of the People's Disclosure Movement, uh, the People's Love Alliance, and the Global CE5 Initiative. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about that today. Um, he's also an international networker and, and uh, has uh, quite a large group. He's built a wonderful uh, environment for people to come and enjoy each other and share their experiences called etletstalk.org. And I'll have that link in the description at the end. Other than that, Costa, man, it, it's great to have you here finally. <laughs> Thank you very much, Zen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to basically continue our conversations, you know, yeah. with gaps in between of a few years, but none, nonetheless, very strong and, and, and vital ones. Well, it isn't life about cycles and spirals yeah. and, and patterns and processes, and, and, uh, and we all have them. We just may not all recognize them when they come. Right. And also time is just a sequence of brain states. Oh, and yeah. so the fact that we've maintained our connection uh, and the way that we've maintained our connection with all the people that mean something in our lives, uh, I like to say it's just a matter of time, which doesn't exist. So that means that we're always connected then. Well, according to Willard, I, I, mean, I was going to mention this later, but since you bring the, the concept of time up now, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Wilbert Smith's material that uh, he was the... Uh, Canada's uh, Ministry of Transportation Director of Project Magnet, which was Canada's UFO investigation in the 1950s. And he had conversations with uh, a little more in the CE5 type, right? But he had some me uh, memoirs, memoirs that weren't published until two years after his death. So I don't know if he intended them for public view or not. But one of the things that they had told him, he called them people from elsewhere, was that time to them is a measurement in the change of entropy i found that fascinating hmm. i uh i love the definition on a certain level and yet my mind cannot wrap around itself <laughs> wrap itself around what that would be like but that's okay because we are creatures of another kind of valuation of time so right. we necessarily wouldn't be able to map map ourselves to and maybe someday we will as we advance in our own consciousness and understanding which oh yeah obviously much beyond us um speaking of beyond us let, let's let's go back in the and step in the way back machine for just a moment and, and see if we can find sherman and peabody right um that dates us doesn't it though? <laughs> yes <laughs> those are my they were my heroes many hours spent as a youngster just enjoying those two absolutely on tv too. Um, so when you first, and obviously you've been interested in this field and metaphysics and ufology, and, and it's now called ufology, it, it wasn't for a long time. When did you first begin to notice your uh, fascination and, and your curiosity with those topics? 
What happened to you that something that into your awareness? Yeah. Um, well, th there was something that preceded all that that led to a moment of, aha, this is it. I love it. And what I'm talking about is what preceded as a child for me was, uh, I can remember in uh, grade school, devouring all the science fiction books I could find. We would have a little mobile library that would drive up to our grade school and they would parade our classes outside and allow us to go into the library and pick what we liked. And I had two topics that fascinated me, sports, found all the baseball and football books I could find okay. and all the science fiction that was available. So I read a lot of that and was just thrilled by the words in the page that would come to life for me by, by very talented writers of the day, people, people like Ray Bradbury and Poole Anderson and Isaac Asimov and many, many others. Right just expanded and created pictures in my mind of a wider universe that I loved, couldn't devour enough of it. Isn't it uh, interesting how the words on a page, oh when, yeah, when you kind they of give yourself pictures. to them, they just create this whole other world that you become immersed Worlds. in for a while. Yeah, yeah, multiple ones. Yeah. So at, at age 11, I had a paper route, I saved my money and I got a three and a half inch reflector telescope. And I was there in my backyard in Indiana on summer and winter nights when I could, uh, gazing at the stars uh, and just looking up in wonder at them and, and just feeling like a real tug, a, a real awe, and just loving to feel like I was part of a something vast and infinite. As, as small as I felt, it just was a comfort to know that there was this, again, this wide universe. Sure. And I would imagine what life there might be out there, you know, on those far-flung you know, stars and planets and all that the science fiction books had already lighted my imagination for. Yeah. So I had the telescope and then growing up in the 60s, uh, there were the moonshots and there was the, uh, the I mean, I remember when uh, the first Russian man went into space, the first uh, American. Yuri Gagorov. Uh, yes, I didn't know how to pronounce it, yeah. but I can spell it. And thank you for that. Right. And, and then, you know, the U.S., you know, freaked out, had already freaked out over Sputnik and the satellite thing. So that era began uh, mechanized and manned uh, space flight for us. And regardless and of that what... That was our next door neighbor. You and I are both from Indiana originally. A couple of Hoosiers, you know, took us a while to, to reconnect. But John Glenn was from Ohio, Right. 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 So all this was local and uh, eventually later from Wapakoneta, uh, Neil Armstrong, also mm -hmm. from Ohio. So so there was the, the, the manned space stuff. I mean, really, the 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 first foray of Russia and particularly then the U.S. Uh, to the moon, <laughs> to the moon and back, as right. they say. And that captured not only my imagination, but at the time, the whole world was um, enamored of mm -hmm. the. I kind of like uh, hanging out there myself. <laughs> were, you, were you orbiting and what, was that you that i saw in my telescope uh, maybe. I, well I mean, you know i'm, I'm kind of looking at the earth from here now or it's in the background so uh, that's true so I i'm not sure really where you uh, are i thought you might be a studio but wait a minute you could be like orbiting at the uh, moment the moon you know, or edgar mitchell meant, meant a great deal to me and i think he actually took this picture um yeah so it, it was uh uh, it seemed fitting, you know, especially with the show, One World in a New World gives us a different perspective looking perfect. at us from afar. That's perfect. So to finally answer your question, after all the background, uh, I might have been 11, might have been 12, and I went and was looking at the new paperbacks at my local drugstore where they had, you know, these little mm -hmm. merry-go-rounds of books, and one caught my attention. It had a picture of a classic 50s picture of a uh, dome shaped with a, a cupola ufo mm -hmm. and it was written by i'm sure one of the contactee members of the um, the contactee movement the the, the 40s the, the 50s the 60s and so on mm -hmm. i don't remember who but i tell you it had a lot of glossy pictures taken by the author or others like him um of ufo shots you know classic stuff that you know you can find on the internet now Right. Assuredly, some of that may have been probably was fake because there were a lot of people faking things. However, in the mix of all that, I really felt like people have captured something and I was 
smitten. One or two uh, slid through. What's that? I say one or two slid through. One or two probably hung and slid yeah. through. Yeah, so I was smitten and read all that I could. You, there was UFO magazine, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was, the, that was the moment. I remember being in the drugstore and my eyes falling on that book and suddenly realizing, oh, my God, I really do believe they are here. People are photographing them. People are having experiences. And uh, this was like the completion of things. Not only do I... Now, not only did I then just be able to look far away under the stars, but now it became personal because these books and these photos were telling me, well, they're here. You know, there some people had met them on the ground, but they were in our skies. So that kind of completed the circuit. You know, it, it wasn't something uh, unreachable. Those civilizations had found a way to come to us. And that to me was the opening of a new chapter in my life. I wanted more. But as we continue talking, and I, I bore you with the rest of my life, I held on to that interest for a while, but then went on to have what I call a pretty conventional kind of life for a young guy from the Midwest in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, OOs, and beyond. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's way back. Um, way well, back. You know, we, I have to admit even for me growing up in that time and, and I had some direct experiences that I didn't realize what they were in, until later, um, going into those conventional, more conventional lifestyles was kind of the only possibility that we had at the time, because this topic certainly wasn't all that well received. And, and those that did get into it were often kind of ostracized. Um, and still maybe a little bit today, but not near as much. I had a, a similar thing with you, only I, I, eight years old, I started having these dreams. I, I'd wake up in bed looking at my body. I'd watch my body climb out of bed, walk across the neighbor's backyard, climb a fence, go into this cow pasture, 10 acre pasture, and I'd start rising up into the air. And I'd look up and there was an orange cigar shaped cloud that must have been a mile long. And these things happened uh, twice a month for almost two years or right about oh. that time. And then right before moving to Arizona, I was walking through a bookstore in Muncie, Indiana, uh, just a few miles from where I grew up. And this book falls off the shelf. Oh, nobody, yeah. nobody around. You've had that kind of experience. In yes. Life. Yeah. And it's kind of eerie, right? Until you get used to it. And then it's yeah. like, oh, cool. Another one. All right. Um, <laughs> So this book falls off the shelf, opens on the floor, covers up. I walk over and it's Ruth Montgomery's Strangers Among Us. Mm. And I pick it up and I turn it over. And the first paragraph that I read says that the most common contact the experiences in the Midwest in the late 50s and early 60s was the orange cigar shaped cloud. Oh, my gosh. And yeah, you know, and I hadn't thought about it until that moment. And then all these things come flooding back. It's like, wow. Okay, what else, right? So, and I'm sure that, that with you and, and your curiosity, where, where did it take you uh, in the later years in, of your life? And, and how did you deal with the, two questions, right? Where did, where did it take you? And how did you deal with the internal things that were going on and um, being able to articulate what was happening and, and have it understood or at least have some kind of, um, audience or, or listening from others. Did I you? tell you, um, during the conventional parts of my life, and by that, what I mean is I went to university, got a degree in computer science, minor in mathematics, and um, came out to California, got a job in the San Francisco Bay Area and worked in the Silicon Valley um, until my retirement, actually, in 2014, mm -hmm. as a software engineer. Congratulations on the retirement, yeah. by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's seven years now, and that's a nice number, sure. seven, um, uh, which allows me to be doing what I'm doing right now full time. Uh, but during those years, I maintained my interest by loving to watch science fiction movies that came along. Uh, sadly, back then, as probably now, Hollywood was producing a lot of the creepy scary you know aliens are coming here to eat us or take our women or take our men or take our lawnmowers you know whatever they thought would would scare, really scare us 
Right. Uh, but I still, you know, watched all that stuff and, and kept kept my finger in it. Well, it's funny but, how that's trickled through in, in the consciousness of, of most of humanity to where there still is that reticence to be open and there's this fear of the what other happen. Yeah. But you know, we're changing that, and that's part of what I hope to be talking about in our conversation here. How I mean, you you nailed it right there. So true. And the thing is, it doesn't have to stay that way, and it hasn't been staying that way, and it's changing more for the positive, and uh, we can expand on that. And but I think right the, now we have a, a golden opportunity uh, up close and personal with the conditions that we're having to face now, where we're being taught to be afraid of each other, and, and now we have to get over that in mass in order to move forward and learn how to work together. And there, that's intertwined. Not only have we been taught to fear the other coming from outer space, but like you say, we're in a position now where we're taught to fear the other who's next door, you know, because their skin is different, their language is different, their practices are different, whatever. The challenge is we have to fix our relations here on earth, as well as fix our relations with those from the stars that, that clearly see that that is our, our issue. Uh, but they're here to help. And again, I can talk more ab ab about that uh, because they have gone this same road and have conquered the, the lower aspects of themselves, the mm -hmm. ones that we're in contact with have, and learn to get along in harmony and go to the stars and, and come and therefore find other civilizations like ours that might need a little helping hand or a little more understanding about how important it is to start getting along um, otherwise we perish together right uh, and that's where we are these days yeah and, and so, have been there for a while too I, my first <laughs> article i wrote about it was 1988 uh, uh just looking at okay why would you know a uh, more advanced race want to deal with a bunch of barbarians you know other than to hey <laughs> guys there's a better way right it, and that's it we can help you, but you got to take care of your own mess first. Well, if you're the monitor on the playground and you're watching the fifth graders getting into fist fights over who owns the kickball that they've been playing with, right. over what is silly stuff or can be really silly stuff, you can't do your growing for them, but you can go in, separate them, and try to give them some kind of uh, you know sure. advice uh, or offer or an offer to to uh, mediate or something. There is something you as the one who's gone through that phase do have to offer without doing the work for them, but just assisting them along the way to do the internal work themselves and learn how to get along. Um, you know, I, and, and it sounds like a little bit like a flippant remark I'm making, but uh, you know, about the playground and all that. But on the other hand, that is what we must seem like. And it, the problem is the little kickballs that I was using in my in my example here, are nuclear weapons. Right. Um, and those toys, those big nuclear toys we have, uh, have huge consequences if they get mishandled or if accidents really? happen. I, so I, I welcome about. the other civilizations to come and do what they can. Absolutely. Uh, per our request and with our free will to help us along that road to get over that, uh, that destructive scenario that, that we can be in and right. let me just say and i'm not a pessimist or anything i'm a cautious optimist so i'm not trying to spread any doom and gloom here just acknowledging like anybody who looks at the news and is aware of the world situation just acknowledging where we are but at the same time you have to acknowledge the human spirit and the potential that we have to make things right between ourselves to establish right human relations Right. And to literally create a, um, a golden age on earth if we want it. And I think it's part of what we need to do. I mean, we've grown population wise. We, we've grown, grown from little, you know, small tribes, villages to then regions and states, nations. You know, and now here we are a, a global village or at least on the mm -hmm. cusp of, of becoming that. Um, you know, Jeff Mishlev had mentioned that once uh, one of his um, friends that is in contact had said that they see us as a bunch of alpha males uh, competing with each other. Yeah. In, in silos. And that what they're hoping will happen is that 
that lower, you know, kind of a groundswell will take place where there's this shift in attitude like we're talking about, where that fear of others goes away and it turns into some kind of a more of an embracing of each other yeah. and, and learning about each other rather than fearing each other. Because that's usually the, the essence of the fears. We don't know. Well, when we find out and discover, hey, you know, these people feel and think pretty much the same. The cultures may be different, you know, different types of uh, traditions and things like that. But the basic people are pretty much all the same. And that uh, is our common humanity. We need to, uh, I agree with you, that we need to emphasize that, expand it everywhere, and and teach it, especially to the younger generations. Because basically, most of the time, you have to teach separation and hatred and division to young children. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm thinking Nazi Germany as one, just one example, not, not to pick on Germany, but th that's what those in charge back then did, Hitler and, and his marshals is they got them young and educated them in the ways of of them being superior and and being in charge and so they know dominating. No yeah and anyway so great education is needed and it is going on uh on the earth and we have to acknowledge and and and, and, and find it because the mass media doesn't reflect a lot of that to us now no, but you yeah. make a great point that the um, the instruction that, that kids get and you know so they don't necessarily know any better because we we don't really teach those deeper critical thinking skills deductive logic and things like that till college when those should be some of the things that kids develop young so that they can think for themselves we don't uh, our system doesn't necessarily allow that because we're you know as a teacher i, I was mm in boxes with 50 kids and you know there was only so much you could do in that box yeah yeah and, i agree we need to overhaul that um you know i realized i didn't answer the second part of your previous question i don't like to leave things hanging i was gonna head back there <laughs> and i i I'll, let me give it a try and let me see if i actually do answer it or if i am kind of misremembering it okay i think you asked me kind of in a really how did this affect the rest of my life what were uh, um, yeah how what happened in in that process of becoming aware of that and noticing the difference in others and how did you bridge that what kinds of conversations that you had did you have that allowed that to take place effectively well all my life and again because i grew up in the 60s and 70s were some of the greatest United States social movements were born. Mm -hmm. um, and I was a, a, a young activist in my teen years and beyond uh, in one cause or another, whether it was the anti-Vietnam War or whether it was um, uh, the, um, um, actually the uh, learn to be a feminist, the women's movement or the movement for Native American rights lots of movements and so part of my fabric of my soul was to reach out to others already as a young person and try to build bridges and build movements to make things better for societies um, as a whole so again that was bred in me um, it's still in me and that's why we're having this conversation so along the way i was always uh, involved in either some self-initiated project or somebody else's movement, doing my part, playing a role, mm -hmm. trying to make the world a better place in one way or another. So that's how my entire adult life was affected. Despite the fact I was working, you know, in a regular job as a software engineer, you know, getting yeah. married, having kids, getting divorced, getting remarried, uh, still at my core was always this activist who needed a mission, a role to play, and was always finding something to be involved in again that i thought would make the world a better place a positive contribution i am so that, totally that, hip to that yeah yeah so and that's why uh what happened in 2006 then the culmination of that was uh the experience i had for a week making my first contact uh with uh they like to be called star people i do i call them ets too which is technically correct but i don't call them aliens um they don't like that 
um, or they prefer rather star people or star friends, mm -hmm. star family. And I had encounters with the natives call it the indigenous refer to them. Yes. Yeah. And there's, there's a good reason for that. Oh yeah. But there was a week in September there in 2006 here in Northern California at Mount Shasta where a number of experiences up close and personal uh, happened to not only others, but to me, which brought uh, me in contact with our star friends and changed the course of my life, even though I continued after that week to uh, to work normally and like everybody else does and pay the bills and whatnot, I started to work part-time and increasingly more and more to what I'm doing full-time now is what happened. But I started to work more in that area of contact with uh, our, our star friends. And it was just wonderful. I can tell you a little bit more about the details of that week because they were... Uh, for me, mind-blowing and life-changing, um, or not, depending on what direction you want to go in. <laughs> well, yeah, it definitely um, can be mind-blowing and, and a little freaky at times, too. So what was it that, uh, what kind of communication took place and what changed in your awareness as a result? I think that's probably one of the most critical <laughs> things, right? Yeah. Um, we were learning, uh, and I was with a group of 40 people, how to make the close encounters of the fifth kind contact, which is the human-initiated, interactive communication with star civilizations, with star people. Um, so we were practicing that and spending nights under the sky, um, the dark sky, and actually seeing the results of our meditation efforts using consciousness as a group to reach out to them in thought and with our hearts. And they would respond. We would we learned to see the flashing, zigzagging lights in the sky responding to the lights we flashed at them back and forth, or we would see the orbs in the trees, all kinds of experiences that week that the group was having. But uh, there were three experiences that I had uh, up close and personal that just emphasized, you know, the, the, the whole thing and just put a real exclamation point on it. Um, one of them was that. Um, I had the habit of talking to my wife every morning, telling her what we experienced the night before, because before leaving for that six days to make this contact, I had conflicting feelings. I was excited. I had never heard before that you could actually do this, not right. just passively wait and maybe see a UFO, because I had plenty of stories from people I knew and trusted to whom that had happened, and I believed them, uh, you know, but... The fact you could do it yourself was new. So I left for those six days going, I want to try this. But the other part of me was the part that Hollywood had already programmed for years, which was be afraid, be very right. afraid. So with a little trepidation, but a lot of excitement, I went, right? Kind of mixed. And the experiences I had there, the, the, the up close and personal ones happened in such a gentle way that I realized they were engineered um, in the most comfortable way for me to not be afraid, to not like run away with my hair on fire and all that. So for me, they happened in the most perfect, mind-blowing, box-opening kind of way. Kind of a soft so, invitation for the curious. Yes. And every person has their own limits, what scares them, what they can handle. Mm -hmm. And I think these were like, again, like I said, we're engineered to deal with my limits so that I could accept them. And, and I'm grateful for that, for those that did it. But anyway, before I left for these six days with this excitement and some fear, I said to my wife, or I asked her, why don't you come with me? And she says, you know, uh, I was a, kind of a NASA geek when I was a kid. I was into the space program and stuff, but I really wasn't into science fiction or astronomy or caring about the larger universe. Um, and I've got several businesses because she's a, an entrepreneur. She had businesses to run and bills to pay and all that. And she said, go have fun. I support what you're doing. but And I believe that the universe being very large, I believe that they're here and that there is life. But I don't see what it has to do with me personally. I have businesses to run, but I support you. So that was great. Not all couples <laughs> have that kind of a group. Was, absolutely. That was a real blessing to have that kind of understanding and support 
in that you know I, my metaphysical meanderings uh, i scared the bejeebers out of my first wife and I uh, it was i i do too right but that doesn't eliminate those things in, in my own life you can't deny them once they begin happening that's true you have to be you have to be true to yourself in the end yeah so to make the long story short um with with her uh, support she said go have fun but i don't see what it has to do with me i went was having fun meeting new new friends uh seeing things in the sky learning how to recognize what we could put a label on hey it's a plane it's a satellite mm -hmm. uh it's a star it's this and that and what we couldn't put a label on that was responding to us in different ways and that was the excitement of it so i was calling her every morning telling her about the previous night's activity you know excited like a fifth grader oh my god you should have seen this this happened that happened right and about the fourth night morning she stops me just before i could start you know my little narrative about the night before and she says wait a minute I have some story to tell you. And I thought to myself immediately, what could be cooler than what happened to me last night? You know, what an ego thing, right? And I laugh at myself <laughs> now, but it was an honest reaction. Like, I'm about sure. to lay all this stuff on her and she's got something. Okay, please tell me. I'm all ears. Oh, boy. In our bedroom, not 20 feet from where I'm sitting right now, uh, the night before, she had just turned out the lights, was slinking down into the bed getting comfortable um and you have to understand she's a professional clairvoyant and has been all of her life and so she has an inner clairvoyant mm -hmm. sight but what i'm about to describe happened with her outer eyes and she has excellent night vision like a bat so this was not a psychic thing that she saw it was literally with her eyes open as she's getting ready like i said to scooch down and close her eyes and go to sleep suddenly at the end of the bed boom there are four maybe five figures standing there um they are translucent white uh, about three and a half four feet tall they have big heads big eyes couldn't make out the features here but she thought there might have been a mouth mm -hmm. um two arms and she couldn't see their legs she could see their torso but they were at the end of the bed and so the end of the bed was hiding the lower parts of what she assumed were bipedal uh, bodies right so that says to me this was not like a projection they were there in the physical reality because something physical like the bed was actually hiding the lower part of them so there are these four maybe five once in the back behind the others beings sitting there staring at her and she was just shocked because again she was not the person who has she doesn't have a great imagination in this way doesn't care about science fiction and fantasy and yet uh there was this in front of her and she was not afraid at all she was speechless as she, they stared at her and she could hear in her mind their thoughts and they were saying to her in this um sing-song fashion they were going who are you who are you and we realize today that we believe they had found me up at mount shasta and because of my strong energy connection like anybody in a relationship has they probably saw this energy linkage going back to somewhere and maybe they had some spare time they decided to follow the energy to the other end to, to our bedroom and they found her and so this was just a really curious who were you and um she felt these waves of love coming off of them and that's why she wasn't afraid right again she was shocked into speechlessness but there was this love enveloping her and finally she was got it together to, to think to them um where are you from yeah who are you <laughs> yeah well <laughs> yeah who are you where are you from and being the um she had a civil engineering degree from princeton and an mba from harvard so she was very much a scholastically minded person she she uh, says to herself years later the first thing i should have asked them was how'd you get here the engineer in her would like how'd you get here right, right. no it was like it could have been something even worse she could have said like what's your sign no no um <laughs> no <laughs> um but she said where are you from and then she heard uh, again in a sing-song fashion the answer came through her thoughts 
Arcturus. Now, because my wife Hollis had never been really technically into astronomy, she didn't know all of the stuff that I had learned when I was 10, you know, and, and into astronomy, that Arctur Arcturus is what they call a hypergiant now, I believe a red hypergiant, it's a star. Mm -hmm. So she says to me, Arcturus, is that a place? And I go, oh yeah, 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 that's astronomy 101. It's a hyper red giant, it's a star system. So they're telling you they're Arcturians. She goes, okay. And then they slowly started fading away and then they were gone. And if you know her, instead of being afraid or unable to sleep or whatever, or you know, turning out all the lights, you know, so people would, she just went to sleep and kept it to herself till the following morning. And so I, who thought I had the coolest stories around, suddenly I'm sitting there, as they say, my jaw dropped as I'm listening to this. And now you're envious. So I'm going, yeah, I'm going, okay, uh, you went that one. That's, that is an awesome story. And then she said to me, okay, that's a place. Now it's personal to me. It's personal. They were here. Can I come with you next year? And we've been together on this journey ever since then uh, because they made it personal. And during interviews, I always like to thank them wherever they are, if they're listening in, to thank those Arcturians because they deliberately made it personal to her to my significant other in a way that mattered right to help her realize the universe is as big as she thought and it it actually had eyes and had thoughts and had bodies and so yes it was personal and she she joined me in this exploration that we've been doing well for, to me that makes perfect sense right i i understand at least to some degree that thoughts and feelings and words are all vibrations and that this these advanced races have developed their sensitivity far beyond ours you know we think of for instance we have five senses using 10 percent of our brain that's kind of an accepted axiom right well what about the other 90 percent and if you do a simple ratio could we have 45 more senses with that or yeah. are those five distributed similarly in those other nine perhaps planes and William Swigert had a, a technique called multiplane awareness that kind of lends itself to that and then you have you have the solfeggio frequencies that also are nine that are in tune with that as well so here's these different systems and patterns that are coming together and it comes back into that awareness that when you kind of like the where two or more gather thing right yeah. where, where you are and, and when you're tightly connected with someone there are um links whether it's energy whether it's you know silver cords or, or frequencies mm -hmm. or, or whatever we don't have the capacity to really understand the exactness of the details of that but we can understand the concept of it especially when the synchronicities like that are involved where you've got something pretty much similar going on in two different places now that takes us into the ability of living in quantum entanglement in the unified field right i think that's part of my personal feeling is that's part of what they're drawing us into is to understand that more deeply would you agree i agree because uh there's the the phrase that we toss around in our community um sometimes almost very glibly but it, it it still is important and profound, and that is we are one. There is one mind, one consciousness in the universe, and we are all, I believe, fractal uh, parts of it. But mm -hmm. there is one mind, and if that's true, it's the ultimate entanglement. It means that right. every time, every space that we could conceive of or not even conceive of is all folded within us and accessible to us if we know and accept the fact that we can open up mm -hmm. and and uh, touch any time and space and place that we want. Absolutely. I truly believe that it's all within there. And I, yeah. I think our star friends have achieved some of that. And I believe it's to their delight it, as they see us. Absolutely. Those possibilities and wanting to explore uh, the, the, the extra senses that we have. Well, and like you were saying earlier, we've got the 
um, the young programming, right, that keeps us in a separate place that, that we don't necessarily understand the concept of one oneness. And when we do first hear it, it's like this woo-woo kind of thing. And it's like, well, how does it all fit? Well, as you begin to break it down or, or quantize it, if you will, it doesn't change the, the, uh, the aspects of the individuation of consciousness in these forms. It's like the, the NDE that I had in college uh, at Ball State in Indiana, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. um, I came back with the understanding that we are cosmic consciousness condensed into form. We don't necessarily know how to expand on that or how to go back home yet, right? But we have that point of light that bounces back and forth between the body and the great light in different mm -hmm. incarnations. And now there's comes a time where when we begin to understand that and understand the science a little bit deeper, that it, it echoes what the sages have been saying in that everything is one, we're all connected, and each of us, more than likely, have that perfected form, fit, and function in the world that we aren't necessarily aware of yet. And that may be, from my engagement with them, kind of where they're leading us to look inside to find where that is. And, and you, they're here to lend a helping hand for that. Absolutely. Uh, they see the promise within us, even if many of us are asleep and don't see that promise and others are just partially awakening and maybe some are fully awakened. The promise is the same and it will get revealed. Uh, I remember in uh, 2010, uh, four years after I had the experience I was mentioning to you during that week and, and a couple other experiences, which I you know might get to, uh, that had uh, the effect of blowing my mind open mm -hmm. and, and really realizing the beauty and the synchronicity that you mentioned. But in 2010, um, I had communication with my star friends uh, through the help of my wife, who is a good communicator telepathically. And I asked them uh, if it, in their larger plans, if it would be useful for them to organize people like myself all over the planet who were learning to make this uh, personalized direct contact with them, whether it would be worthwhile to organize people and get them together, even virtually on the internet, to make a unified group approach, you know, to them. And they said, oh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, we would like you not to think of us not as gods, because human beings would, you know, right. this is not a dig at religion, but people have used religion um, in order for us to slaughter one another, uh, because my God's better than your God kind of thing. Right. So one of the first things my star friend said in this communication in 2010 was, don't think of us as gods, think of us as elder brothers, sisters, and cousins. We are family. And that set the stage. That, that helped me um, frame my relationship with them, which persists to this day. For me, they are, if not star friends, some of them family bouncing around as that little cosmic light here there and everywhere we have relationships all over not just in human form on earth uh, so they are family and if, if anything i want to instill that fact to your to your viewers here they want to be known as star people and as star family and in the same way that as you and i let's say are struggling with some kind of problem that we want to solve and we hit a wall uh, we don't know how to solve it. We're frustrated. And then we find out we have a cousin in another country who reaches out to us and says, hey, did you know that we're related? I'm here. You, you, you got a problem? Anything I can help with? And then you say, okay, here's the problem. Here's where I am. And then you get some advice, some guidance that might help. Mm -hmm. I'm using that as an analogy as to how they are reaching out to us from what they've told us to be mentors to guide us uh, without doing the growing ourselves for us, but allowing us to do the growing ourselves and yet providing guidance and mentorship uh, according to our free will, because we need to ask. Right. They they are there as family, as star friends to help they're us. They're a lot more subtle in their communications than, than our regular family star, right? They, they do have that respect, at least the, from what my experience is and others that I know like you, 
the, the subtle impressions that we get. They don't beat us over the head with a sledgehammer or slap us upside the head with a cosmic tube before if we make mistakes. Those, those, that's our doing. What they do is that they will either communicate in some fashion, whether it's a uh, subtle impression energetically or a thought or an image yeah. or even a series of words, the sing song kind of stuff. Um, because they're not, they don't intend to offend or frighten. And again, that side, that part of it's on us as well. Speaking of the frightening part of, there's a lot of stories that of those that have had uh, horrible experiences, right? I, I haven't personally, and, and most of my friends have, have never, I, I'd see it a different way because I understand their methodology and it's not frightening, but to someone who isn't prepared, it can be yeah. scary. How, have you had any of those kind of folks that, that have gotten over their uh, fear or even talked about the experiences that they've had that were not the best that they're trying to understand? Well, I was one of those. Like I say, I approached my first experiences with fear. And then I had a gentle introduction during that week of, of contact that has eliminated the fear. Uh, and in the community where I've been a facilitator at etletstalk.com, I hear lots of stories from veterans and newcomers to this contact. And they, they run the gamut. Uh, a lot of them are people who were not prepared, and I've heard those stories, but who later on reflected, later on in their lives, reflected on experiences that they had that might have been, that were frightening as a child, let's say, mm -hmm. and yet realizing they were not harmed at all. It was just the unknown and not being prepared for something that put them in fear, and that's quite natural. You, Absolutely. And and that's the thing that I found is again, talking to those and, and walking them through the process of going back and, and just asking questions. Well, yeah, you, you were afraid, right? Yeah, well, then, and you were scared, but were you harmed in any way? You know, and 99.9% and yeah. .9 of the time, they'll say, well, no. And there then, you go. It was just your they, reactions. Your... And those wheels begin to turn yeah. and they realize, oh, okay. So maybe that wasn't so bad. And I'm, you know, it, it's all in how we see things. It's a perspective that we take, whether it's, you know, being able to walk around the circle and look at things from multiple points or in the yeah. case of what we're talking about, maybe having more of a, a thoughtmospheric response where you're looking into a much greater awareness and connectivity. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, I would... Um... I don't know if you've heard of Ray Hernandez and his group who created um, uh, a, re a research a few years ago that's still vital with more than 4,000 uh, uh, people asking. Right. Yeah, do, yeah doing I spent the weekend dive. with Ray at the International UFO Congress here in uh, there you go. Mountain well, Hills. He, he and his, uh, his, his uh, group of, uh, of scientists, an esteemed bunch, produced that most vo voluminous study um, of those 4,000 people who'd had contact experiences of all kind. Now, admittedly, this included what we term par paranormal experience, experiences, mm -hmm. you know, ESP, I mean, NDEs, um, um, OOBs, uh, contact with uh, extraterrestrials, etc. Now, in the aggregate, uh, their statistics showed that I believe it was 85% of all these respondents um, reported that their experience was positive or at the worst neutral. And that left maybe, I guess, 15% that were not described that way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, someday when you get a chance uh, to interview Ray again, you can ask about that 15% because I think that in that group must have been a, a whole bunch of people who just didn't understand what was happening. They weren't actually harmed, but it was something strange and unexpected that did put them in the fear so that they could come back and say, well, no, it wasn't positive. I, sure. I was afraid. But and we have to keep in mind that the... It takes, I was just going to say, realistically, it takes years sometimes to work through all yeah. of that. So don't expect to happen uh, for it to happen overnight if by chance something's happened to you as a viewer. Um, oh, absolutely. And this changes upside down 
the, the abduction thing. And this is one thing I've learned from Ray and from this particular study in that uh, using the word abduction is such a negative, fearful thing to begin with. His statistics just flip all that on its, uh, you know, upside down. Mm -hmm. If 5% of the people there um, said that it was positive or neutral, how can you say that was an abduction, you know, in a, in a negative way that was uh, harmful and hurtful? Right. So uh, I applaud the way he and his group have, have uh, used the word experiencer more than an ab abductee absolutely you know i, I do too it's great amazing. work the book's actually called beyond ufos and right. i'll have that link included in the description oh, okay. or, uh, below so yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah they've really done some fantastic work. oh it's it's uh, about this thick they've got the charts the, the statistics they do i've got a copy of it he sent me one and uh me I've too. Actually written a chapter for the new book which you may have hasn't come out yet I don't know if, it, if my chapter will end up in it or not. Um, but I think it's due out this, this uh, uh, well, it's supposed to be due out this October. So I don't know if it oh, I see. Yeah. Not yet or not. I know that they're with the uh, situation with COVID that it was a challenge for them to get together and, and continue to work on it. Yeah. But it's great work needed to be done. Very much needed, quantified so that we, we can talk with knowledge and with numbers to to people who want to understand and who, who say well none of this has been documented this is all hearsay it's all anecdotal mm -hmm. uh, now we have you know again numbers and statistics that well, even so we we still need to consider that these are all subjective responses well, yeah. to the survey too so subjectivity can offer some confabulation as well as you know, just missing the mark in, entirely with what people want to report. But by and large, when you've got that many people reporting and there's that much data, there will be some trends, right, to come through. Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, it is, again, much needed. And, and we are in uh, a thankfulness and gratitude to them for, for doing all that, that deep dive. Right, um, right. Definitely. Now, how, when you're meeting with these people now and they're needing some hand holding, right, which we all do from time to time, how, what do you find is the best or, or the most practical advice or um, situations that you can offer to them to help in their own process? Because people's needs range, they're on a continuum, there is no one one answer. But I try to listen to what it is their issue is. And let me say, I'm not, not a therapist. I'm not trained to, to be really good at this stuff. But I have learned in the uh, 15 years I've been doing this that certain uh, things come up over and over. So I, I've done some learning and gotten feedback on it. So there are things I can suggest to people again, depending on what their issue is. Some people feel alone. Um, they've kept an experience they had that was profound for them, mm -hmm. but had no, no support. Uh, or if they opened up their mouths, they got judged. Uh, some of them institutionalized, some of them turned into black sheep, etc. What I can offer to those people, just as in one example, is, wow, we are a community. Um, I can hopefully hook you up with uh, if not someone physically nearby who has a group so that you can get together and find support and find camaraderie, well, then at least on the internet, uh, help you find other individuals who have similar stories so that uh, uh, you can help each other. Yeah. And the hookup will have no probing involved. <laughs> no probing involved at all. Um, yeah, that was the uncomfortable guy. <laughs> Oh, there's a comfortable kind? Oh, well, of course, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, my answer depends. And it always comes back to community. Whatever it is that they tell me that they have the problem with, somebody in the community has already been there or is there and can, um, can help them out. So, for example, um, in, in quite a few countries, I have some very activist members in this ET Let's Talk community 
who welcome people to their country. So I know that when I get a registration in my community on my website, for, say from someone from Canada or from the state of Florida or from England, uh, where we really have a presence um, or Japan, and I see the person is geographically there, I go, oh, okay, I'm gonna send an introduction, introductory email to my three friends who have the network in that country. Mm -hmm. And these are people who are particularly welcoming, um, who have uh, groups on social media, who have spawned CE5 groups all across their countries or their states. So I have a place to send people who need some help to others who have been down the road with them. And I know that they're in good hands because these are friends that I've vetted over time and uh, they trust me, I trust them. and we have created uh, a safe community and that's uh, two big factors right there safety and trust yeah you don't get that all as much as you want in in the regular world when you open your mouth and say you know i saw a ufo for just for example you don't things have changed since i grew up it and you alluded to this at the beginning of our conversation that it's, it's gotten maybe better, and not maybe, it has gotten better. Um, and depending on where you live in this country or in the world, there's more or less stigma you still have to work through. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know if it's gotten any better. The community has grown. The, those people have been able to find each other now so that they don't feel so alone because the, the resp public response is often still the same if they don't have a direct experience of it. Well, let me give you some statistics about the fact that you say it's gotten bigger. Um, not only has it gotten bigger, it always was big, but of course, when people don't talk about it, you never really know how to count them. Right. until they start opening their mouths or raising their hands, and then you go, oh, one, two, three, four, five, oh my God, there's more than I imagined. Um, our People's Disclosure Movement, of which ET, my community, ET Let's Talk, is one network within it. The People's Disclosure Movement is a network of networks that I, um, um, I founded that name and the concept of it in 2010 as a, after a conversation with my star friends that, that I alluded to before. Within that movement, um, and I know this is an undercount, but it's the best that I could come up with, uh, along with the help of an ally who actually helped me with this, um, we have a million people in more than 100 countries on the earth who are in the people's disclosure movement. These are people actively making their own contact now or interested in it or following it. But they are in that lane of us being a people's disclosure and not waiting for any government anywhere to right. make that announcement that so many are, are waiting for. Why give them that power? the power that we gave them for the last 70 years they used to make us seem like we're crazy and to cover things up so we flipped that on its head in the people's disclosure movement and decided we'll do the disclosing ourselves we have the tools this and this right make contact and then to find each other in this movement and realize that we have already disclosed that our friends from the stars are here we don't need that announcement, that press release, whatever. We did the disclosure, which, by the way, my star friends said that we reached we reached a tipping point with that disclosure in 2019. In that, just in time, just a, yeah, <laughs> it's what they promised in 2010 when they said, um, "Please do organize people doing this. Create." They told me back then, "Create as many ET contact teams as possible, in as many places as possible, as quickly as possible." And someday, uh, as more people see us in the skies and want to communicate with us, that gives us permission to appear in more places where even more people will see us. And that gives us permission to appear in even more places. Mm -hmm. So that's what they call the virtuous circle. It's an organic growth. And since 2010, that has been operating. And we're all over the world now doing this. And when I asked them in 2010, well, what's the, uh, what's the purpose of doing that? They said, well, someday a tipping point will come where so many people all across the planet have seen us, accept us, want to interact with us, 
that no government or institution of authority moving forward from that tipping point will ever, ever again be able to cover us up, to lie, whatever, because the disclosure will be in the hands of the people and the authorities will have lost their credibility. So in that way, we the people own the future. We own the future of contact. It's in our hands now. And my star friends have said, it is, they gave me an image, it's a snowball rolling downhill that can't be stopped. And that's an important message I want to give to people listening here. We are part of the greatest movement in human history right now. It cannot be stopped. The tipping point was reached two years ago. And uh, just in time for everybody to go virtual with the restrictions and seemingly that perfect timing. I said this to my wife that at the beginning of the restrictions that, you know, hopefully this obsession on self hygiene and the sequestration will get people to turn inward and clean their acts up too, which is exactly what this activity, its ultimate goal is to have that accomplished and for the people to truly realize that, yes, they do hold the power individually and collectively yeah. by agreement not by command and control, which is what we've been used to. But there again, you know, we've got uh, a, a lot of people tend to want to talk negatively about that and start pointing fingers and this and that and the other. Let's, you know, back it up a little bit and look at the span of time that we've had. And we are a planetary civilization that's evolving. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, it's kind of like uh, somebody said, it came out of my mouth one time, you know, we ascend at the speed of surrender. Well, surrender doesn't necessarily, it's not a giving up, it's a giving to. And that giving to is to that, like you were talking earlier, it's to this place and this place, and, and even with the star people in native ways as well, the indigenous, the third or the first brain, which is a gut, being able to, to feel and sense that. And I know you as a, a water baby and me too, that's kind of what we do first is we feel and then we let it process. It's not necessarily we think first and then, you know, shove it through. We let it rise up and, and have that uh, series of questions that come up or, or the queries or the curiosity, right? That And that's, it's important that people have that curiosity um, uh, and open-mindedness. You know, when new people come into the uh, community, I, I ask them, you know, it's okay to have skepticism about this as Absolutely. long as you have an open mind around it that is willing to look at facts at your experience um, and willing to change. If you come in as a hard-headed person with uh, the heart of a skeptic, nothing that ever happens will ever be good enough. It'll always be explained away, and I, we can't help you with that. Yeah. But um, Nothing yeah, wrong with just, testing. What's that? I mean, the, the truth loves testing because it's going to stand whatever it is. That's that's the a good point. Question, the, the more it'll stand, the clearer it will become. And it'll be true in many dimensions. Mm -hmm. Any place you try to knock on its door, it's still the truth. And 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 sure, I tell people experiment. We're an experimental community. I don't think any one of us, myself for sure, does not have all the answers. No. To, to how many civilizations are here, to exactly what they're all thinking, to what their plans are. I do know from what I've been told through my own contacts that they're here because they love us. They see our potential. They see the danger we're in, but they see the potential that we can uh, create the future we want with their help if we agree to take it mm -hmm. and create a paradise on earth. Uh, it won't happen, happen overnight. But it's a process as long as we're open to it and find others like us. And that's what the uh, the other thing that I, I founded, which was the People's Love Alliance, which is a billion hearts that have already opened on the earth. If even just a little bit from what my star friends tell me that are people who see the possibilities of actually getting along and wanting harmony on the earth, um, a billion of them. And the mass media won't reflect that to us. But if you go like, if people go to Good News Every Day or to other websites and groups that feature good news that's happening around the world, you will see lots of evidence of people as individuals or in their aggregate doing kind and compassionate things 
to make the world a better place, whether it's to make our environment better, our relationships better, bring water to a village somewhere, bring peace to warring parties, on and on and on. There are light warriors, whether we call ourselves that or not, a billion doing this in small and large ways. And the Let people's love alliance that goes a little deeper. Do you think that that, that there's a natural design within us that is emerging now with this call, uh, and not just from the star people, but also from the needs on the planet right now and, and moving out of this critical situation with some kind of um, beneficial results. And, you know, the like you're saying, the aspect of harmony with self, with others, and, and with the planet, when we can achieve that, or at least have a notion toward that and ask questions about that. To me, that seems like a natural progression. So somehow it's got to be embedded within us. I, I agree with you. I think, uh, I think it is embedded in us, and it, it primarily comes out of the human spirit. That spirit will not be held down forever right? It can cover itself with materialism, with greed, with hate, and experience a lot of things in incarnation after incarnation as a result. But I believe that uh, divine spark in us, and I don't want to get into labels of God this and God that. I'm, uh, uh, I believe that ultimately love is really what is a being in the universe. We're part of that. And that spark we have in us, uh, to your point, Zen, will not be denied and so i also think that our star friends are aware of that and that's when i talk about the potential they see in us you know maybe with their perceptions beyond five senses they could see that infinite flame of love within each of us that needs some fanning so that it gets bigger so it's not just a pilot light you know right. it's become a, a wonderful consuming uh force for good and I think they're here to help us, one, realize that, to fan those flames, join with others, and remake this planet, burn away through our flames the, the gross materialism and the greed and the hate that so far has defined humanity writ large throughout the centuries. But again, which we have the, the possibility to change right now. Absolutely. It, and this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm doing One World in a New World, it, is right. to talk about this process in, in all kinds of different ways and how others are doing that in the business world, the spiritual community, in the ET or the star people community. Um, and, you know, look at a big picture and, and we're all saying the same thing differently. And so I'm encouraged by that kind of collective and, and collaborative action even if it's just with similar activity now in the ancillary groups that it will eventually begin to find one another and have like your group and, and other you know even business groups and things like that begin to come together and, and start uh, integrating communicating figuring out you know ways and methods to work together to have a better community and that's the promise of the internet, you know, b before it became the thing that it is now, which is instantaneous communication anywhere in the world to those mm -hmm. who have, um, you know, a smartphone or a laptop or whatever. It, it might, it was not as possible, but now we have no excuse. We can't say, oh, oh I, I don't want to hook up with groups in the other part of the world that are doing good things yeah. because I can't. Well, you can. So it's a gift. For those of us who have the blessing of access to technology. Those of us who do, and not everyone does, but it has been growing over the years. And uh, those of us who have it have a responsibility to use it. Wisely. For good and wisely. And we are. Um, that's why I mentioned that if you want to go to certain websites, I mean, I have a Facebook group. and Not everyone's on Facebook I, for understandable reasons. But if you check out Good News Every Day, I'm just one of the many groups there whose members post wonderful stories of compassion, kindness, where something bad gets turned into something better yeah. because of a person or a group. And that's our definition. And it's great to feed your soul in the morning when you're sitting with your coffee. Absolutely. And say, 
reading the headlines from mass media about the latest earthquake, war, tornado, whatever, and those things happen. We can't uh, deny them, but we can choose to create something better. And by going to groups like Good News Every Day and, and reading even just half a dozen posts of people doing good things, man, this is like, in addition to having your beverage of the morning to get your physical body going, if that's what you do, you're also feeding your insides to get your morning and your day started with positive affirmations of human beings behaving well. And, right. Right. and, and that gets you started out on, on, on a good path. I recommend that to people. Awesome. Uh, and, and I really appreciate that you mentioned that. I'll also include that link uh, below. Our time is just flown, and I really appreciate no. you sharing uh, the, the information and, and the stories and, and the invitation to move beyond constrictions, right, and to open up and, and look at things a little bit differently. Be aware and to share. Right? That's, yeah, uh, I ask people to, oh, to do what's happened to you and us, you and me, and so many others, which is open your mind and you will find we have a lot of, uh, and I'm speaking metaphorically, a lot of hands reaching out from the inner dimensions as well as from the outer space. It's all in sight anyway. The words are funny. But we have a lot of hands reaching out to help us give a hand up, you know, if we but ask. Um, and that goes for humans around us as well as for the, the star people. And once you ask, it's a mandate. It'll be there. That's I think there that's the exact way. way you want it, but it'll be yes. there. I agree with you. We have to choose, we have to ask, and uh, not ignore the negativities, but choose to just use them as a jumping board and go, we can do better than this. Yeah. Do you see that? That's not so good. We can do better and then start doing that and focusing on it. That's what the star people are asking us. As as creators, we we will mandate that that these better things happen in, in our uh, awareness for ourselves and for everybody else. Absolutely. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about all this uh, because it's, it's close to my heart and because I want people to know that we're not alone either on earth with the numbers of people, the People's Love Alliance. We're all working, even though we may not know it, in our millions to build a better world. In the same way that we are reaching out in a million people now, the People's Disclosure Movement growing every day, reaching out to our star families to also build our future. Uh, the People's Love Alliance and the People's Disclosure Movement are one side of the same coin. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we can't profess to want to have relationships with those out there if we're still beating up our neighbor because their skin color is different and say, oh, you don't count, but the guy in that UFO counts or the gal up there. Not true. We, we got to work on both ends of things. Yep. Love, our, love our human neighbors, love our cosmic neighbors. And um, so we're becoming cosmic humanity. And I want to leave one more statistic with your folks. Uh, 1.3 billion people, adults, uh, research has shown that was done about five years ago, 1.3 billion with a B, believe in intelligent star civilizations, not microbes under a rock somewhere that they exist plus they believe that we should contact them so think about that one out of seven people on the planet as you talk about numbers and what's acceptable one out of seven people on the planet in theory they're not all making contact because some of them half of them are looking for their next meal the next day but in theory they believe life exists we should communicate this is our low-hanging fruit for those of us we don't have to convince others with the latest video that something exists we right. should reach out to those who are already 1.3 billion in our group let them know about us and that we make contact and welcome into our community and we'll build it from there and so i want to give that optimism to people that uh, there's many more of us believe in this and want to work with it than any of us ever realized it's that trifecta of faith love and trust yeah, I like that. I'll put that on a t-shirt. Cool. cool. <laughs> Costa, thank you once again. I, I appreciate the time and 
Namaste and in la catch. Thank you for joining us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.